Good evening. A little feedback there on the mic. I'm Sheila Edwards Lang. I'm the Vice President for Minority Affairs and Diversity here at the University of Washington. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this event tonight. Um, I think it's very um, fitting that at this time in our nation's history, we have one of the, the nation's leading voices on social justice, equity, and inclusion. And he's bringing special emphasis to the issue of science, technology, engineering, and math. The University of Washington has a long and distinguished history of promoting civil rights, of promoting equity and inclusion on campus. It started with um, President Charles Odegaard back in the 60s at a time that Reverend Jackson knows a little bit of something about. Um, this campus leadership at that time listened to the voices of students and put into place the Office of Minority Affairs and Diversity and, and many of the programs that are still on our campus today. It's fitting that I have the great pleasure today to invite my boss, the, pre the current president of the University of Washington, President Michael K. Young, to this podium to give welcome. President Young. Sheila, thank you for that kind introduction. And I want to take a moment to thank you as well for the extraordinary passion you have for helping our students become STEM graduates in this, uh, in this city and in, in this institution. Uh, you're, you do such a terrific job. Thank you. I also appreciate being introduced by Sheila because she is the only person at the university who officially calls me boss, and I really appreciate that. <laughs> I want to welcome everyone here tonight. As university president, you every once in a while have an extraordinarily special opportunity, and the opportunity to be tonight on the podium with a true American hero, uh, someone that I admire so enormously, is a great privilege. Reverend Jackson, we are honored that you're with us tonight and deeply grateful. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, I also want to thank our uh, provost, Anna Marie Kausi, who is uh, unfortunately ill and not with us tonight, as well as our Office of Minority and Diversity Affairs for hosting this wonderful event tonight, uh, as well as acknowledge the presence of some of our regents tonight. We have uh, Constance Rice uh, here uh, with our former great mayor, Dorn. Uh, Pat Shanahan uh, is with us. Joanne Harrell, uh, and uh, Rogelio Riojas, thank you. I'd also like to recognize the members of Seattle's Urban League, who were instrumental in the Reverend Jackson's visit to Seattle. Would the members of the Urban League please stand and let us thank them for their service? Now, to ensure that he gets appropriate exercise, I also want to thank our UW Foundation Board Director, Nate Miles, who played an integral part in this. Nate, would you stand again? <laughs> we also have a number of our university leaders here, and community leaders, and thank you all uh, for being with us tonight. Our passion as a university is one of a public mission. We view, view ourselves as the University of Washington. And every part of that notion of public mission and Washington are central to our identity. We believe deeply in promoting access and have a deep commitment to focusing on continuing that along with our path of excellence. As one of the world's preeminent public universities, advancing social equality is integral, essential, deeply embedded in who we are. Our commitment to access is absolutely essential for diversifying our three campuses. Uh, indeed, as you think about the issue of, of equity, as you think about the issue of access, it's easy for us to think about it as a core mission because it is, at a profound level, important in so many ways. It's important to the individuals who have the opportunity for an education and the transformative effect that has on them as well as on their families. But it's also important to us as a society. Um, I was once told by my father, who was a child of the Depression, that only very rich people can afford to waste something. 
We are not a nation rich enough to waste anything. And to waste the talent, the brilliance, the energy of so many young people is absolutely unacceptable in this society. It also makes an extraordinary difference in a different way. Um, I'm always struck by the fact that when I am surrounded by people who have my background, who sound like me, who are all lawyers, we not surprisingly come up with exactly the same answer to every problem. But when I'm surrounded by people who come from different backgrounds, different perspectives, different experiences, different training, they help us come with different solutions, solutions that matter, that are innovative, and that move our country ahead in the way that we need to move ahead in this time of not only great national competitiveness, but world competitiveness. Access is essential to who we are as a university. We work in that in a number of different ways. Tonight we're talking about access with respect to the opportunity for STEM degrees. Important. We need to make sure that women and underrepresented minorities are successful in these high demand fields, currently defined as science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And Reverend Jackson's here to tell us more about these fields, especially technology, computer science, and engineering, the needs for a more diverse workforce. We need to ensure as a university, however, that the pipeline for that diversity is available, that women, underrepresented minorities, and everyone receive the training necessary for the jobs that exist, and these jobs that are creating our future. We've done some things that we think are effective. Um, for five year period between 2008 and 2012, we ranked number seventh in the entire country for the number of degrees granted in science and engineering to women. In 2013-14, almost 25% of the degrees granted by our College of Engineering were earned by women, which exceeded the national average by about five percentage points. I have more statistics, I won't bore you with all of them, but I will say our challenge is that slightly less than 8% of the degrees granted by UW in STEM uh, in 2012-13 were earned by underrepresented minorities. That has to change. We do lead the, the Pacific Northwest Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation, which is aimed at increasing recruitment, retention, graduation for underrepresented minorities. Since its founding in 2009, funded by the NSF, the number of STEM degrees in these fields to underrepresented minorities has increased by about 70%. All of which demonstrates to us that with modest commitment of resources, but with passion, energy, direction, and the right programs, we can make a difference. We've seen the number of students from underrepresented minority groups in these fields increase now at a much more rapid rate uh, than are compared to our non-minority students. Uh, and these are important. Another program that we have uh, inaugurated uh, really follows on our athletic program. So we call it a red shirt year. And we have a program uh, particularly pioneered through our College of Engineering where students are um, identified with great promise, though they may come from schools where their training in math and science hasn't been quite as strong uh, as necessary to really process effectively through engineering. We bring them to the university based on the scholarship and then in the process, uh, give them an extra year of training uh, in order to prepare them for the rigors of that and also to introduce them to the opportunity, which many have not been exposed to, to participate in these fields. Uh, we have uh, earned a designation as a pace setter school by the National Center for Women and in Information Technology in recognition of these and the other programs that the university has designed. We've also been closely engaged outreach activities to the K through 12 schools across the state with a wide variety of programs designed to inform, to educate, and to inspire children across the breadth of the school systems uh, in our area uh, to pursue these degrees. Built a foundation, clear to us that we can do this. Our commitment is that we will do this. This needs to be done. Tonight will give us an example of exactly why it's so important. The Reverend has assured me that he has persuaded Microsoft to hire all of the graduates who come out of these programs. <laughs> so we are, we are ready to go. Reverend, we are grateful for your presence here, for galvanizing us around this very uh, important issue. And with that, I will turn it over uh, to Sheila again for a few minutes. Thank you. Pulling something together like this um, in a short period of time, um, it's only possible when you have committed volunteers and a committed staff. So before we go any further, 
I would like the, the team from the Office of Minority Affairs and Diversity who have worked almost around the clock for the last two weeks to stand up and you all just take a bow so that we can thank you for. So often people think that things like this just happen naturally, but it is a whole team of people behind the scenes who make sure that everything happens, and I have to make sure I take time to thank my team for their work. I also want to thank the UW leadership. When um, President Young was talking about the progress that we are making and the work that we still have ahead on science and engineering work on our campus, much of that is due to the cooperation and collaboration that my office gets from the other vice presidents, vice provosts, and deans in this work, as well as we have a lot of national leaders and who are doing this work on broadening participation in science and engineering. And I want to thank all of you all for the work that um, you have done and the work that we will do collectively together um, with Reverend Jackson's message tonight. The Foundation Board is the uh, group of committed volunteers who help us and <coughs> provide that margin of excellence with private support. And we have um, one of our community leaders um, who is a graduate of the University of Washington, that's Mr. Nate Miles. Um, Nate is a graduate of the UW and he is one of our greatest advocates. He, um, when asked, he serves not only the University of Washington, but the community at large. He is responsible for putting the Urban League board back together and, and putting our Seattle Urban League back on solid ground. And he is responsible for um, bringing Reverend Jackson to our attention that he was gonna be in town and have an opportunity for us to do it. So it's my pleasure to welcome Mr. Nate Miles to the stage who will introduce Reverend Jackson. Thank you so much, first giving honor to God who is the head of my life, to President Young and his wife Marty, first lady of this university, to Sheila, Reverend Jackson, to all of the regents, students, faculty gathered here today. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be here on such an auspicious occasion. Um, but I had to think as many times as I've been in this building, I think that's the first time I've ever been in the first row of Kane Hall. <laughs> My teacher was very prof. Wake up, Nate. Um, so it is, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, I have known Reverend Jackson over the years, and many of you know he is the founder of, of a Rainbow Push Coalition, one of our foremost civil rights and religious organizations. Um, you know that he has over 40 honorary doctorate degrees and the Spingar Medal and a number of other awards that you know, I won't waste your time in, in going over because you can, you can go in and find him. You can Bing him. That's Bing since we're in Microsoft territory. There you go. We're in Microsoft territory. We don't, we don't G nothing here. We Bing it. Bing it on, baby. Bing it on. And, and so, we, so we Bing it on. And, uh, and you can read all about him. But, you know, just as someone who has been such an inspiring leader in this country, I think about Reverend Jackson, and I think about when I got into this school, as I said earlier, I appreciate the EOP program, proudly being a member of the EOP program, a member of a, a beneficiary of affirmative action, which helped give me the opportunity, not anything that I was not deserving of, but just an opportunity that I had never been allowed to get through school. And I remember getting through school and getting in the business world and being the first member of my family to graduate, so I thought, you know, I better try to you know, play it cool and not let anybody know where I grew up in the east side of Pasco. And nobody but my business partner, Daryl Powell, knew uh, where East Pasco was. Um, but, but, you know, I take that back. Rogelio knows because they have a clinic over there. Um, but, but um, you know, I was looking at myself and I didn't want to talk about growing up in the projects. I didn't want to talk about when someone asked me what I did, I didn't want to talk about eating welfare food every now and then and the Reagan cheese that they used to give us and the beans out of the gray can with the black writing on them. It was embarrassing to, to think about. And I know all of you never had to experience any of that, but for me, shopping at Salvation Army and the Goodwill and, and St. Vincent de Paul was kind of hard. And I didn't really like to tell my story when someone would ask me how I grew up. But one day in 19... 
during the uh, presidential campaign, I heard this guy start telling my story. I thought he had stole my story. He said, I had a mother who wore run over shoes and holes in her stockings, not because she didn't know better, but because she wanted my brother and I to wear matching socks. And I started thinking about my mom, who was a part-time domestic and a part-time bus driver, who did that. Who, when the people gave us hand-me-down clothes, never said, I don't want those clothes because they have a hole in the leg. She would sew a patch on both knees so that I would be matching. He talked about how this mother worked every day. And I thought about my mom and, and, and how, how, how when he said those words that day, at the Democratic Convention. He told about being in, born in the slum, but he said, you know, I was born in the slum, but the slum was not born in me. And it wasn't born in you, and you can make it. So wherever you are tonight, every black person, every brown person, everybody that fit under that rainbow that he talked about, he said, hold your head high and stick your chest out. Just know that you could make it. He said, and, and, and you may not be running for president, but I am, and I run for you. So tomorrow, when my name goes in nomination, your name goes in nomination. And that was the thing that he told so many of us that made us think we could do so much. And Reverend Jackson, 30 years later, when you and I were walking out of that building down at Mesconi Center, like I said, when you look around that corner, the dreams that you've kicked off of me, this is nothing. To be able to bring you here and to be able to help you and work myself to the bone to get you around and to get the goals and objectives you're trying to get accomplished, it's nothing. I can never thank you, nor can most of us in this room, for what you did for America. Because because of Jesse Jackson, there could be Barack Obama. Let's just be real about it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the 1984 and 88 presidential candidate Presidential Medal of Freedom winner, please stand to your feet and greet Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson, Sr. Let me express my thanks, my delight, my joy being here with you tonight. Uh, Nate, for such a kind and generous introduction, let me express my thanks to you. One of the leaders in Washington in that campaign went on to become the mayor of Seattle. Uh, and to lead a multiracial, multicultural city was to accept the epitome of the rainbow. He is a man with great dignity, and we love and appreciate him so much. Mayor Rice, please stand. <laughs> Somewhere here tonight is our national youth coordinator, Will Hall. Please stand. And the director of our Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley and uh, Silicon Forest campaign, Mr. Butch Wayne. Butch. He's somewhere down south preparing for the Microsoft <laughs> shareholders meeting on tomorrow morning. There's a certain Tension in the air tonight, President Young. There's a sense of the undercurrent about to take us on, it seems. Out of the grave, Michael Brown speaks to us tonight. The spiritual dimension of it is that. He is resurrected. 
he speaks louder out of the grave than the man who killed him speaks above the ground, which is the power of a resurrected spirit. Tonight in the darkness, the Christ in Ferguson illuminates the darkness. I've come to the great Northwest with my friend and brother, Nate Miles, over in Portland now here, to go to the shareholders meeting of Microsoft and to try to meet with Amazon. They've turned their doors shut and Microsoft has opened their doors wide. Yeah, we will not give up. We will not surrender. The same applies to all the industry, banks. We bail out the auto industry and they began to bail out, take their industry over to China. 20,000 auto dealerships in America tonight about 30% index African-American and Latino, 200 African-American dealerships, 300 Latino. Uh, our investment is far greater than our return. It's true in banks as well. The banks that use foreclosure schemes uh, driven by subprime lending, predatory lending, we bail out the banks. They left the people out. I hope President Obama will go to Ferguson, just as at some point in time, Eisenhower had to address in a meaningful way Little Rock Nine, the crisis of that day. At another point in time, LBJ had to cry out as we marched from Selma to Montgomery about the right to vote. This is one of those pivotal moments just as uh, these turning point moments are almost always driven by students who come alive and risk it all for the rest of us. The darkness is being illuminated tonight. Urban police, we want to give them more machinery so we can watch them. But police are simply gatekeepers. What's behind the gate is the issue. What, what are they trying to keep? Behind the, the gate is the cry out for justice. Behind the gate is the challenge of economic reconstruction. Attorney General Holder continues the investigations of civil rights charges and death of Michael Brown, of patterns and practices, violation of civil rights because they do not meet federal standards of employment and contracts. In a strange way, uh, Rice, we realized when President Obama was elected, it was a kind of morning time. We traveled that journey from the 54 Supreme Court decision, making apartheid illegal in this country, setting the pace for the rest of the Western world. The Montgomery bus boycott, I might add December 1st, just two days ago, Rosa Park set down December 1st, 1955. We kept marching and it took us from there, there to Birmingham. Out of the bloodshed was born the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Now the Civil Rights Act of 1965. The tragic fact is this Supreme Court would not vote 9-0 to end legal discrimination. This Congress should not vote for a 64 Civil Rights Act or for a Voting Rights Act of 1965. There's this violent undercurrent, the attempt to set us back. Whenever we have faced these challenges and our wisdom and courage our distance the cowards who sought to sow seeds of fear we always won. We never, we've never lost a battle we fought and never won a battle unless we fought. It's a tug of war for the soul of America. Dr. King was wise enough to make the mission of SCLC the mission to redeem the soul of America. 
We seek even tonight a federal grand jury in the case of Michael Brown killing in Ferguson, Missouri. In many ways, the, the Michael Brown killing was that caboose on a train of abuses that made people come alive. The president said, well, we should honor the law. We should honor just law. Rebel against unjust law. But the jurist said it. The jurist set the killers of Emmett Till free. The jury set the killers of Matt Gavis free. The jury set those who beat Rodney King free. The jury set the killer of Trayvon Martin free and Diallo free. Enough is enough. We're not going back. If no other reason than you've come alive is because the death Michael Brown has inspired something different within our souls. Did we give up? Because it seemed that it's kind of hard. Surely the other side will prevail. 1965 was known as blacks getting the right to vote, but in reality, that's not quite what happened. After 246 years of legal slavery, unlike the genocidal policy, against Native Americans was 246 years of legal slavery, not immigrants, not refugees, but legal slavery etched in the Constitution. We got the right to vote the 15th Amendment in 1865 and left it in the hands of former slave masters. They, along with segregationists, held it up for another 100 years to 1965. We always had the heavy lifting beyond just our own needs to have moral authority. You can be a minority with a majority vision. You not, need not limit the strength of your character to one side of town or to one gender. Blacks could not vote because of various schemes in the South. White women could not serve on juries. 18-year-olds were serving in Vietnam could not vote. You couldn't vote on college campuses. You either had to go home to vote or vote absentee. You could not vote by language until 1975. You couldn't get proportional representation until 1988. Rice, you were part of that movement, making it clear that we should accept proportionality and not want to take all. It seemed, Dr. Young, not to mean very much at that time. If I got 47% of the vote and my opposition competitor got 49%, they would get all of it and wipe out the enthusiasm of those who supported the candidacy. We made the case in 88 of proportionality. It was seen as a kind of bone tossed my way for the campaign. But by 2008, it took on concrete meaning. In a very heated campaign between Hillary Clinton and President Obama, Hillary won California barely. She won Texas barely. Pennsylvania and Ohio and New York. On the 84 rules, she would have been the candidate. But we democratized democracy in 88 and changed the course of our country because we never gave up. We kept fighting in the dark. Tonight, I challenge you students to go and, if you will, um, Microsoft Kern Commission Report. Don't Google it, but just Microsoft it. <laughs> and read the Kern Commission Report explaining and interpreting the riots and rebellions of that season, much like tonight. That report has an analysis, recommendations, and a budget. Speeches will not change what we're facing tonight. I challenge you in your marching to keep marching, to do so with nonviolence. Not because you're scared, but because you're wise. Violence, you cannot, in a practical sense, fight tanks and AK-47s with bricks. 
In another sense, in another sense, violence has a way of distracting attention from the main agenda. If the agenda is poverty and ignorance and disease and discrimination, if the headline is a brick, it does not address the issue of the day. On the other hand, violence is not redemptive. We challenge our nation to be less violent and more civil. We don't want to imitate the worst of our country. We want to lift up the best of it. We must go another way. We're grappling with something very intrinsic to the character of our nation in its DNA. Racism and genderism are mental diseases. Racism and genderism are mental diseases. With sinful actions affects our behavior and our attitudes. Gender and racial inequality are cultural diseases. The question was asked to Jesus one day, who is my neighbor? He didn't revert to who lives across the street or who lives next door. He said by parable, once upon a time, there was a man attending to his business. He was innocent, unarmed, walking down the street. And thieves jumped behind the corner and beat him and robbed him and left him to die. He said three men came by. One was of his own religion, the rabbi, the minister, the man of God. He saw him bleeding and went to the other side of the street and kept walking as if to say, I'm on my way to my religious service. I cannot get blood on my robe. Look in heaven to go in hell with ignoring a hurting man. Another man of his own ethnic persuasion, my soul brother, my ethnic kin, the Levite saw him laying there bleeding. He went to the other side of the street and he kept walking. The Samaritan from a different country, a different culture, who spoke a different language and worshiped God differently, stopped and helped him up, put him on his donkey and paid to get him his medical supplies. Beyond color and culture, something called character. At the heart of our education must be our capacity to care. I went to the University of Washington. People care that you know. I went to law school. People care that you know. I'm a physician. People care that you know, but really they want to know that you care. At the heart of our humanity is that we have the capacity to care. Remember when you're tempted to give up sometime because it gets dark. Deep water does not drown you. You drown when you stop kicking. You can drown in a bathtub if, if, you don't, if you don't raise your head up. Deep water does not drown you. You drown when you stop kicking. We have learned to survive apart. I'm black, I'm Latino, I'm Asian, I'm this, I'm that. We've learned to survive apart and find some comfort zone in our apartness, in our separateness, in our own silo. But tonight we have a bigger lesson to learn as Americans, learning how to live together and not die apart as fools. We say French, France for the French, Germany for the Germans, England for the English, but some out here, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses who yearn to breathe free. Those who yearn to breathe free, you have a home here. That's what makes America great. It's dark. The arrogance of war has contributed to that darkness. To engage in a preemptive strike and kill several hundred thousand Iraqis, 6,000 Americans, 50,000 injured, lost more than $2 trillion, we lost money and honor and moral authority. The arrogance of war has led to, to darkness. We're still in the war in Iraq. Went on and killed leadership in Libya, 
Now there's an ISIS crisis. Seemingly no end in sight. But the darkness is driven by a policy, a policy that's beneath the dignity of the nation's promise. We must have a foreign policy that has some basic principles. International law, human rights, self-determination, economic justice, and one set of rules. The Supreme Court taking the guts out of the, six, out of the 65 Voting Rights Act, making voting more difficult and less accessible, removing voting booths from college campuses, darkness, In North Carolina, let, reducing the number of days you can vote. In Texas, taking 600,000 off of the rolls. In Texas, you can use a gun ID to register, but not a student ID to register. A kind of darkness. This Congress would not have passed the 64 and 68 civil rights bills. Darkness. Health care for the poor on the attack. South Carolina, for example, my home state, one-fourth of the citizens are in poverty. Uh, and yet that governor will send back $12 billion because the money comes from, from the federal government fighting the Civil War all over again in the name of the Confederacy and the religion of the Confederacy. Every state from Virginia around to Texas sent back billions, Texas $100 billion. Florida $64 billion. Billions in federal highway uh, money for, to build international highways, money sent back for education, money sent back for health care. And some of these same twisted souls uh, really want affordable health care, but not Obamacare. They want insurance for the first time. They want to be able to get the medical test without, uh, without the uh, user prerequisites. They want the children stay on insurance till, the t till 26. They want Obamacare to end, but they want to keep affordable care. They want an omelet without eggs. <laughs> it's a kind of insanity that leads to the darkness. The banks are bailed out. Probably lose several million homes, right? Well, because the banks targeted the black and the brown, according to the lawsuits. They made money for subprime lending and predatory lending, private mortgage investments and insurance. And then we bailed them out on a two-page document, left homeowners from middle class to poverty. Dog, we challenge Silicon Valley tonight. This genius of creativity built on the shoulders of government contracts. Silicon Valley comes out of the, the defense industry. It's our, it's our Silicon Valley. It's, it's our Silicon Forest. And yet tonight, with all that we mean to them as consumers of the products made in our industry, the top 20 companies, 189 board members, 36 white women, three African Americans, and one Latino. That's unacceptable. Worse than that is the issue of the C-suites, even worse still. Employment around 2% on average for blacks and 3% for Latinos. Investment virtually nothing. At least as segregated as the police force in Ferguson, Missouri. Police are the gatekeepers. What's behind the gate? Companies that make billions and have offshore tax havens. What's behind the gate that the police keep? Well, we focus so much on the police and miss the police headquarters. We, we focus so much on the mailman and miss the post office. Police are simply the paid gatekeepers. What's behind the gate? Patterns of bank corruption and discrimination. What's behind the gate? An imbalanced field of opportunity. When uh, the Seattle Seahawks play San Francisco in the big game. Everybody's excited wearing the colors of their teams. If you win, there's a measured joy and celebration. If you lose, there's a bit of pain. 
And yet, you win with dignity, you lose with dignity. What makes it so possible when Cell plays San Francisco or Washington plays Washington State? What about that game that allows blacks and whites to play together and we can choose uniform color and not skin color? We can choose uniform, you can choose direction and not complexion. What about that arena that makes this so possible? That makes us so excited about the game? Because whenever the playing field is even, and the rules are public, and the goals are clear, and the referees are fair, and the score is transparent, we can make it. But beyond the playing field, it ain't even. Rules not public, goals not clear. We want to even the playing field in Silicon Valley. They need not bring any H-1B workers here uh, as if they have a special genie on STEM. Teach children here. Bring, repatriate some of that money and bring it back home. <laughs> There's a program right in this town called TAF, led by Sister Trish, who once worked for Michael, Microsoft. The 600 children spoke to them yesterday morning. And they're learning, they're learning what the industry needs. They're learning what's vital to it, STEM. And yet they're meeting in trailers. As we build taller buildings for office space, children taking STEM are studying in trailers, and some others can't study if they go to public schools at all. It's dark. Health care under attack? Darkness. I challenge Silicon Valley to open up. There is no talent shortage. There's no opportunity shortage. There's nothing women and people of color cannot do in Silicon Valley. Hands up, be fair. Hands up, be just. Hands up, one set of rules. Hands up, this land is our land. Why must we focus on STEM and science and technology and engineering and math? Why must we do it now? Uh, Mr. Dr. Young, because we're in the fourth stage of our struggle to make this a more complete union, a more perfect union. The first stage of our struggle, which is the moral cancer of our soul, was 246 years of slavery. Nothing mattered but abolition. Not good slave masters who were kind, the bad ones who were cruel, but abolition of it all. Now, have people talking about good police versus bad police. The issue is, is development. Teachers, not police. Coaches, not police. We need more coaches and more teachers, and more humanities taught, and more philosophy, more sense of that which makes life make sense in the first place. And so here we are tonight, first stage with the end slavery. 246 years. We were in slavery longer than we have been free. 246 years of legal commodity on the, on the market. We were the commodity on the commodity exchange. That's not the American tradition. That's not, the, that's not the tradition uh, of the refugees. That's a different tradition. 246 years of work without wages. For skin color became a source of idolatry for some and damnation for others. It's deep in our DNA, this idea of racial supremacy and gender bias. It's deep in our DNA. We, we should never be free until we're free of the disease of genderism and racism. It's a deep disease. And we should be well, seeking to get well, not seeking to justify our sickness and make life better for all of us. We cannot afford to be that sick and arrogant at the same time. <laughs> Pride precedes the fall. And yet we speak of what makes democracy work, uh, Nate, is checks and balances, separation of powers. The president can go to jail just like a commoner can go, because that's what democracy looks like. But then, if we are not a member of the world court, live above the law and unaccountable, we can go into Iraq and kill the president, kill his sons, kill 300,000 people, 6,000 Americans killed, $2 trillion in debt. So made a mistake, wrong target. That's just the way I felt that day. 
No one can survive that arrogant living above. No one can live beyond grace and mercy. Now dismiss truth as if it is some irrelevant piece of literature. So we fight tonight to even the playing field. The third stage was the right to vote. And that's why that's so critical. But you can be out of slavery, out of segregation, have the right, and starve to death. Unless you have access to capital, industry, technology, deal flow, and relationships. I met so many people who've come through the, 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 uh, the, the struggles within the big tech companies. Fast, high tech, and biotech. And yet, could not grow within the company and can't get capital on the outside. There's nothing magic about growth if you get access to capital. There's something awful if you have, uh, you're told to jump in the pool of water, ain't no water in the pool. How can you live in capitalism without capital? You can't live off the ism. <laughs> you can't tell people I want gravy, gravy without meat base or just greasy water. <laughs> we need what people need, access to capital. Now, if the banks were not lending conventionally because we bail them out, now they got surplus capital, why can't we take some of that 500, 5 trillion in offshore tax evasion? Plus lowering taxes at home. Take 10% of that money, 500 billion. Invest in infrastructure. Reduce, eliminate student tuition debt as a form of forgiveness for our future. In the in the, the boomerang generation, leave college boomerang back back home. Use our money to educate our children, not make the rich richer. Use our money to educate our children and our future. We can and we must. Access to capital, industry, technology, deal flow, relationships. You do business with people you know, trust, and like. Blacks cannot get the money for collateral that whites can get with an idea. Discrimination hurts. Wilson, Wilson is, a mighty good, is a mighty good quarterback for the Seahawks. A lot, a lot of skill, and pass the ball, play under pressure. But my friends, you cannot be a one-eyed quarterback. You can't see half the field. When you lock out women and people of color, you're locking out the majority of the country. When you lock out women and people of color, that's more than half of the country. What's over there on, on the blind side except market, money, talent, and location which leads to growth? Say, say money, market, money. talent, talent. Which, leads which leads to growth. To growth. Whenever, Whenever the playing field, playing field is, even, is even and the rules, and the rules are, public, are public and the goals, and the goals are, clear, are clear, the referees, the referees are fair, and the score, the score is transparent. transparent. We can make it. If on that football field, if 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 uh, if blacks had to run 12 yards to prove some extra because they came from a one-parent household, <laughs> whites had to run seven yards because they inherited some yards, we'd be fighting on the football field. <laughs> but so long as it's 10 yards for all first down. And there's a debate replay. Three points for all field goals. Six points for all to so, so, so long as the playing field the playing is field. Even, even, we can make it. Can make it. Now, if we had to run 12 rather than seven, we'd miss a lot of the first downs. The same with kids coming out of, out of schools, out of schools where you had to run longer than you could make it. First class jail, second class schools. Kids in Chicago in, in prison six months to, to six years in pretrial detention. Correction Corporation of America, prison for profits on the New York Stock Exchange. In most southern states, you have the prison labor camps growing. In Georgia, they're building industries inside the prison gates. In South Carolina, one fourth of all prisoners are leased out the company. They either lease them out or put in the hole for punishment. In, in, in Illinois, they make 600 products in prison. We are a better nation than that. We cannot wait from election to election. We must fight every day 
to make America better. It's dark, but don't internalize the darkness. You can die from secondhand smoke. Don't just don't smoke. Don't be around a lot of it. Don't internalize hatred. Don't internalize fear. Don't internalize means Be better than that. Don't go eye for an eye, tooth for tooth to make you blind, disfigured, and ugly. We got to go to higher ground. <laughs> the good news, when it's dark, it does not mean you have to stop. You can fight in the dark. You can study in the dark. You can march in the dark. You can build coalition. It's the darkness. It does not stop me. If, if tonight, if this room will complete the darkness, someone did the one candle challenge all the, say, if, say if this room were completely dark, and someone did one candle challenge all the darkness. Don't let darkness break your spirit. We fight tonight against these diseases that cripple our souls. A few days ago, I said to Brother Nate that John was on the Isle of Patmos, left there to die in the dark, alone. And yet somehow, as Dr. Sam McKinnon would say to us, somehow on that lonely island, he saw something in the dark. He saw a new heaven and a new earth and the old one passed away. Darkness does not limit your vision, nor your will to dignity, nor your will to decency. Don't stop there. I took a group of ministers, tried to take them with me to see a, a patient who had the Ebola in, uh, in Dallas, Texas. They would not go. They didn't want to get close to the Ebola patient. I reminded them that Jesus, in his day, some call it leprosy. The leper was the Ebola victim of that day with this contagious disease. They didn't have the science to deal with that disease. And so they, unclean, unclean, unclean. And they ran from the lepers. They, they, they laughed at them. They threw them over behind the wall, the quarantine walls. Jesus' is last night on earth, his last night on earth, he spent in the quarantine shelter of Simon the leper, beyond cult and culture, as some call care. And I want you students, as you march, and I want you to keep on marching, don't give up on your marching. To be driven by a sense of a moral compass. Rodney King was beaten nearly to death. Four white police were beating him and laughing, making noise. A young man heard the beating. He could have said, it's not my fight. I'm not going to get in trouble because the black guy shouldn't have been in my neighborhood in the first place. But, he, but some mother's lesson. Some father's admonition took him to another level. You know about Rodney King because a white photographer named George Halliday took it public. Beyond color, culture, some called character. When those, four, when those four police were set free, there was a riot, a rebellion in Watts. A white man named Reginald Dinner drove his truck through the ghetto. Blacks in their rage snatched him out the truck and began to beat him. One hit a, a brick across his head. It was live on TV. And uh, four young blacks who did not know each other rushed to his rescue and saved him from them. And one of those black affirmative action doctors at Martin Luther King Hospital saved his life. Beyond color, beyond culture's character. We can afford to lose our budget, but not our moral compass. Do justice. Love mercy, walk humbly, feed the hungry, defend the poor, deliver the needy, so they won't know more, see the world through a door, not through a keyhole, and let the sun shine in. God bless you. At this point in the program, we are um, delighted to be able to invite um, 
Hadi Partovi from Code.org to join Reverend Jackson on the stage. And we are going to have a QA and a um, from the audience. We have microphones on both sides of the um, auditorium here, and we will entertain questions from the audience. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Hadi Partovi, who is going to join Reverend Jackson here on the stage. Hadi is the, an entrepreneur and investor and co-founder of Code.org. Um, he's an entrepreneur and was on the founding teams of Tell Me and I Like. He's an angel investor and startup advise, advisor. He's taken his, um, his work in STEM and tried to make it more accessible for women and underrepresented students through his work with Code.org. And we're going to invite him to say a few words about the, what they are doing there, and then we will entertain questions from the audience. Hadi? Thank you. Good to see you again. Uh, start by telling us a little bit about what Code.org is and what motivated you to start it. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, Code.org is a nonprofit dedicated to the vision that every school in this country should teach computer science and to get more women, African Americans, and Hispanic Americans involved in learning computer science. At. And the reason this is important is because in the 21st century, computer science is not only one of, but I think, I believe, the defining field for how the 21st century is changing humanity, society, industry, economy around us. And yet, the majority of America's schools don't even offer a course in this field. So at the same time as we see growing industry, growing jobs, billionaires, millionaires, opportunity in the field of technology, most of our schools aren't offering the most basic instruction to our students to have access to that opportunity. And this is not just about becoming the next Mark Zuckerberg or getting a high paying job at a, at a tech company. It's about any industry you want to think about going into in the next 20, 30, 40 years is going to be disrupted by technology. And students who want to enter the job force in 10 or 15 years need to have as much understanding and exposure to those basics as they have to the basics of learning about biology or chemistry or the other things you learn in school. Uh, Code.org started with this vision. What's been incredible for the last year of our work has been seeing the US education system change at an unprecedented uh, pace of change. We've, in the last year, had 50 million students try our one hour of code sort of experience. And that's an international number. Literally one out of three students in the United States have tried an hour of code. We've now established computer science classes in over 60,000 classrooms, reaching 2.5 million students. Thank you. So what's especially special about the number, we have two and a half million students as a follow-on from the one hour experience taking a longer course. And one million of them are girls, one million of them are African Americans and Hispanics. This is, thank you. This is in a field that currently graduates thousands of girls a year or thousands of African Americans and Hispanics a year. And at the elementary ages and in the middle school ages, we literally have a million students in, in basically the underrepresented groups coming in to come to high school and college to, to learn and grow up in this field. So that's what Code.org does. We're hoping to basically solve at least the pipeline issue of the diversity problem in tech. Great. Thank you for that. Thank you. So I'm going to start with a couple of questions for you all. So Reverend Jackson, as you're going around the country doing I this work. Me, I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you're doing this work around the country, and we've heard a little bit about code.org, are there industries or companies that are doing it right that could set an example for the rest of the country? Well, in some sense, in this city, Microsoft is in great contrast to Amazon. There are people working on trying to get, if not right, they're trying to get it right. Uh, when not only did they bring the walls down, they've begun to engage uh, in a very direct way on the plan for goals, targets, and timetables. In part, because not only because it's right, because it's smart, and because it's the key to growth. I, I don't know the reluctance of a company so great as Amazon to this level of inclusion. No doubt that will change, because we will not stop until it changes. Uh, but we must, we must include and must know that the price we pay uh, is too great a price to leave people locked out. And to not engage in dialogue. You want public loyalty, 
You ought to give public service and be a free servant. And so I think to that extent, we, when we go to the shareholder meeting tomorrow at, at Microsoft, we're, we're going, raising the question, make your EO1 data available. I think it probably will happen. Uh, work with us on trying to get a pool of capital uh, for uh, technological investment for, 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 for first timers, uh, expand your job base, and search more vigorously for interns. If you look at, there's nothing that you want that cannot be found. If you're looking for engineers, there's some schools that teach black engineers. There's North Carolina A&T and Howard, and, and there's Father and m where John Thompson, the chairman of the board of, of Microsoft comes from. If you want, to, want engineers, teach them. Want apple trees, plant apple seeds. And I, I'm convinced that if, that if that is pursued within five years, they can catch up. And in your work, Hadi, as you're going around, are there corporations or partners that you've had that are getting it right that we could learn from? Well, among corporations, Microsoft and Google are our largest donors. Um, so they're at least separate from what they do in terms of the transparency. They've, they sort of led the charge on in terms of showing, at least shining a light on where the problems are in their own diversity. They're at least with us investing in, in changing the pipeline. And I think education is the apple seeds effectively in, this, in the world of diversity in the, in the workforce. Uh, so investing in whether it's early education, high school education, uh, college education, that is where we solve the opportunity gap in the long run. But the other part of it, culture and gymnasium also blinds you to the capacity of the out group. Something says women can't fly planes, as if, as if you pick up planes on your shoulders and run them across the country. <laughs> women can fly planes. There's, there's nothing, there's no position a woman cannot hold and hold well. Uh, as if something uh, fundamental about blacks and Latinos, there's something they can't not do in terms of being STEM workers. You're STEM worker if you're STEM trained, and you do well, but you do much. And so if we, if we choose to invest in our children early on, prenatal care, Head Start, and daycare on the front side, rather than welfare and jail care on the back side. It's a matter of what, what our investments are. Right now, we have not made a decision to invest in our children in their formative years. So as you're going around the country, both of you doing this work, um, what is it that colleges and universities could be doing different? You know, we, we have a number of programs here on our campus um, trying to broaden participation in STEM, and we actually had a fair uh, before this with some of those programs highlighted. But are there things that we could be doing on the higher education side to make sure that we're producing more STEM graduates? Well, I know this university can grow its computer science program, <laughs> which is, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the first person <laughs> suggesting that. I think so, I've heard that a time or two. So we, I know high schools are basically graduating three times as many kids, I think, as, as can get into the CS program here. And I know it's not just a university question, it's a funding question. Uh, but uh, what's sad is I think a lot of universities that are basically getting the, the most privileged kids are seeing computer science growth. And a lot of universities or community colleges are not seeing the same demand because kids who don't get access in high school don't think about going into it in college. So, and that's causing an increase. You know, this is a field, computer programming and computer science should be the sort of defining sort of meritocracy field for our generation because a computer doesn't recognize whether you're a girl or a boy or black or white. As if you can tell it what to do, it does not care. Uh, but your teacher does. Thank you. But our, our cultural expectations drive how we program our children. Uh, the reason why you have 60% or so black football players on this campus and 80% black basketball players, because you think they can. And they think they can, and they do. If you practice three to four hours a day for most of the year, on reading, writing, counting, and STEM as you do on push-ups, running, and jumping, you'd be as profound at STEM as you are at dancing in the end zone. It's a matter of priorities. <laughs> that, is, that is not about a genes, that's about agenda. And the coach convinces, well, you, you can make it here. If you come here, you can make it, you can do this. Too. And we, we're not as convinced that, that women and people of color can learn STEM. So much of, much of, the, much of the, the inspiration must be transmitted downward. 
Uh, because kids can't learn. There's nothing. Our children can learn more than one language. If you can learn the rap, a rap album, you can learn two or three languages, no doubt. <laughs> There's at least that. Hey, Mona Bailey. <laughs> Miss Mona. So did we have someone lined up over there for a um, question from that side of the room? Hi, I'm Timmy Foster. I live in Tacoma, about 30 minutes from here. I um, want to thank you very much for your time and coming. Uh, my question to you is um, really centered on my experience, I was in a doctoral program, 10% um, of uh, black students in the program, and um, four, two quarters away from starting my dissertation writing, I was kicked out of the point program, six um, hundredths of one point voted out by a group um, of board members. And one of the suggestions and feedback that I got was I was too social justice um, focused. And I, in all of my learning, I learned that I wasn't quiet enough and I, I spoke a lot. So um, about the injustices that were happening in the program and around the program, I also had some of the most experience with 13 years in um, education as well in the program. So my question to you is how do you maximize environments um, and choices that are difficult politically in terms of like race, power, economic barriers, while balancing accountability to social justice and equity. <laughs> yes. yeah, I mean, because it's really tough, I, you know, and you, 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 the message that you continue to you know, hear the, when the, those- The sound is not good. I can't, I, I really, I'm sorry, I, I really can't. Please come closer. Okay. I want to hear what you're saying. I just can't hear it very well. It's muffled. Matter of fact, come up here on the stage and say it. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so I was in an institution, I was in a doctoral program. You in the doctoral program? I was in a doctoral program, 39 credits into the program, and about two quarters away from starting my writing, my final write, writing project, very similar to a dissertation. And I was voted out of the program with six hundredths of one point behind in my GPA. And some of the feedback that I got was I was too social justice centered and spent too much time focusing on challenging the issues that were happening within, within the program and also around. Um, in addition to some of the dynamics of the program, I was, there was 10% black um, African American people in the program and I was one of the four um, black students in the program. I also have 13 years of experience in education and community work and so I was one of the most experienced in terms of this particular dynamics of the program. And so um, as I thought about challenging it and getting feedback from my advisors, they were telling me, you know, you don't say anything about those things. You can really damage yourself professionally, sit back, be quiet, and, you know, wait until an opportunity comes up again, <clears throat> which it will. But my question to you, Dr. Jackson, is um, how do you maximize environments and choices that are difficult politically in terms of, like, race, power, and economic barriers? while balancing account, your accountability to social justice, equity, and community? We live in our faith and beliefs. We live under the law. When law is oppressive, we must challenge unjust law or oppressive law. Uh, what does it matter if you have a PhD and can't use a downtown toilet? You know, what does it matter if you have a PhD and can't use a theater? As we could not. So we had to, we had to balance off fighting for change and fighting to be equipped to fight the long fight. When right after I came out of jail the second time, I was excited because it was, it was a kind of rush, let's fight this system. And some of our, my allies dropped out of school. Dr. Sam Proctor said, now the question for you, do you want to be a student in the movement or a student of the movement? And I had to make this not to drop out of school to get equipped to fight. When I was young, I would say, I'm fighting real hard so my children don't my children have to fight this fight. I fight to educate them so they can be equipped to fight. The fight will not stop. And so you may have lost by the point 600%, but don't let that break your spirit. Absolutely. Don't give up. <laughs> don't hurt, hurt, but don't internalize your pain. Don't internalize your pain.
question from the other side what, of the Was that the University of Washington that happened? <laughs> was, was, it, was that here? No, was, that, was that here? <laughs> Oh, I was going. I, I was going. I was going to connect with the president if that was too much. <laughs> okay, so we're going to take a question from this side of the room. Uh, hi, my name is Will Johnson. I'm a teacher in Puyallup. Um, thank you so much for coming here tonight. My my question involves, as a teacher, a black male teacher, I heard for years about how we need more people who look like me in education. But my question is, how do we encourage people at a younger age to get more involved? Because like we're saying, we need them in STEM, but if they don't develop those skills at a younger age, and you mentioned it's about culture, how do we change that culture at an early age to get them to where they're now successful in elementary, in high school, and then on that college track? Well, one of the issues is to incentivize more black male teachers, that is a part of it. And if, if we need them, recruit and find them as we do athletes, I mean, like, like find them. Uh, our children must be, you know, uh, our young men play this, this hefty athletic bill because they're taught they, they can do it and they get a scholarship to do it. When I was a, a child, the Russians shot, shot Sputnik up and we were overwhelmed with fear because we thought the Russians could from some angle in space, take a shotgun and shoot us or something like that. We were all scared to death. And we set up something called the National Defense Act. And we paid folk to go to college as opposed to paying to go. They paid them to go. Uh, if you were a music teacher or a physical education teacher, if you took a summer course in science, you went for free. Uh, now we've gone to making student loan debt the highest debt, uh, higher than credit card debt, automotive debt. We should do student debt forgiveness as the stimulus like right now. Because we caught the Russians in five years, we surpassed them and never looked back because we prioritize science. So if we're going to teach STEM, we can't just say STEM is a great thing. Scholarships, incentivize it. Make it the thing to do it, make it the place to go. We'll be at least as good in STEM as we are on the athletic field given the incentives. There's nothing genetic about that. I'd like to make a comment on this. You know, my focus isn't on STEM, it's on computer science. And the reason for that is because, you know, STEM includes science and math and so on. But for a kid who's, you know, in high school or middle school or in elementary school, much of STEM doesn't connect to their real world. Like if they're studying the Pythagorean theorem, x squared plus y squared equals z squared, they don't relate that to how that's gonna get them into a better neighborhood or get them into the middle class or get them a job. If they're studying how to make an app, they completely understand. Nobody needs to tell them how that provides a ladder for them. And uh, surveys show that African Americans score higher than whites on interest levels in learning computer programming and computer science. So they don't even need to be convinced that this is useful. They automatically know this is a pathway up. What's not happening is it's not actually being offered in their school. When it is offered, students absolutely flock to this field. And so he gave the, the Pythagorean theory and those numbers trying to embarrass me. When I, <laughs> when I was taking science, I figured out if H2 is a glass of water, H1 is a half a glass. <laughs> <laughs> then, then I had to leave and play, but that, that, that was my theory. <laughs> Great, so could we take a question from this side of the room? Good evening. Mm -hmm. My name is Jossie Ross. I'm from the Blackfeet Indian Reservation, the Blackfeet Nation, as well as the uh, Suquamish tribe. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge where we are. We're on the ancestral homelands of the Duwamish people, um, who was the, <laughs> who, who the city of Seattle is named after. And, the reason why I bring that up is because I want to address something, um, Reverend Jackson, that you, you talked about at one point, which was the sacredness of our homelands. You, you brought that up as an as a, um, objective of, of the Rainbow Coalition, that natives are absolutely part of, included as part of this conversation because we have a right, an inalienable right, to be within our homelands and in a meaningful way 
the way I've taken that, and so I want to reference your speech just a little bit. Thank you very much. It was a brilliant speech. I truly appreciate that, and it enlightened me. Um, I, I'm edified as a result of the experience. But I wanted to, I agree with everything you said regarding the layers, the, the different objectives and stages, economic development, voting, et cetera, et cetera. I want to supplement that and add one different component, and that is that of, of uh, environmental justice. Because what we see, I think, is that as a result, oftentimes, of those incredible initiatives to uh, integrate workforces and educational places, we see that in many places, um, people of color, black folks, natives, Hispanics, Asians have entered the middle class economically. But what that has done is it's driven consumption. And a lot of us, I think, and from the previous generation as well, my parents' generation, are, they're kind of, uh, they, they had this existential question of whether the goal of that movement, that beautiful movement, civil rights, human rights, was just to join the middle class, to be white people of color. And so, and so the home, our homelands, our native homelands have become the, I'm sorry, then the, but do the you have a war question? zone. I do. Okay. They become the war zone of these places, which is that we have pipelines coming through our homelands to drive this consumption. And I think at adding this component, I want to ask, as, as several of the organizations that I work for, if perhaps you might want to be part of those conversations to buttress that consumption and to talk about, well, yes, we definitely have a right to this equality and to this meaningful living and voting, but we also have a responsibility to make sure that future generations are around to enjoy that, that meaningful standard of living that we have. You know, one of the advantages of, uh, of coming to college if one studies seriously is to challenge a narrative that may be perverse. Uh, and one of them is this idea of Christmas, which is a revolutionary holiday and has become something simple-minded and consumer-driven. Uh, unto us a child is born, children, uh, names should be called wonderful, prince of peace and all that. Up on his shoulders will rest a government and that'll be peace without end. This was the expectation of a radical change from Roman occupation, religious exploitation. This is a serious, sacred holiday which has become a conception holiday. We must change the narrative and not give in to greed. Because if you just change color, don't change character, nothing really has changed except deception. I hear you. Question from that side. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask a question about, uh, so the system is systematically set up against us. And by us, I mean people of color. We have policies and programs and laws that are actually um, pursuing and putting us in jail. This is the new Jim Crow. We have uh, the stop and frisk, which actually allows for racial profiling. And yet we'll t we are told what the answer is to get more people of color into these higher positions. And despite that, we have in the Supreme Court, it was a black man who decided that, you know, had, who voted against affirmative action and who voted to gut the Voters' Right Act. We have a black man as president, and yet black people are being shot by police every 28 hours. So how do we become a part of this system that is set up against us without hurting our community? That's you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that, I think one of the things is that if you think things are difficult now and, and can't measure progress, Emmett Till was lynched at age 14. The killer walked the streets for 40 years because the jury said they cannot imagine a white man being condemned for killing a black man because there were no blacks on the jury. That happened to Meg Evers and it happened to Emmett Till. It happened to Trayvon Martin. I said to a group of students at the rally at when Trayvon Martin's killer was set free, let's turn pain to power, let's register and vote with a passion. 
One student said, Rib, I'm, I'm not with Paul. I'm tired of, of marching. He had never marched before. Uh, I'm, and, and the hell with voting. We've got to get beyond that. I said, would you like to be on the jury uh, and condemn the one who killed Trayvon Martin? He said, I'd, I'd, condemn, I'd bust him. Only rich voters can serve on juries. He said, oh, he ran past the power. Voting matters. Uh, <laughs> economic, economic boycotts matter. Demonstrations matter. Coalitions matter. Being a long distance runner matters. Use all those tools, and you'll win some and you'll lose some. But if you give, if you lose, if you if you drop the rope, you're sure to lose. You could not fight the system pretending you're on the outside. You are not on the outside of the system. When you're born, birth certificate, death certificate, you're you're in it. You might not be fighting in it, you might be mad with it, but you're in it. And I urge you, let's fight together. I'm on your side. I'd like to make a comment, by the way. I'm obviously not white, but I'm Iranian. And I came to this country as an immigrant literally one year after the Iran hostage crisis ended as a seventh grader, which is definitely not a sort of fun environment to enter. And uh, you know, certainly didn't experience the discrimination that I think African Americans face every single day of their lives because of their color in this country. Uh, but I learned very well that behind every rejection lies an opportunity. Uh, and one thing I want to say, you know, we have a black president, but with respect to the shooting that's happening, the shootings that are happening by police officers, just this past week, the president offered a plan to put 50,000 cameras on police officers, which are proven to reduce officer violence. And that is the type of step that takes us forward. And that I very much believe justice and fairness gradually happens over time. It's just we want it to happen instantaneously, and it doesn't happen but nothing can get in the way of eventual justice and eventual fairness. Well, I want the president to put some lights on the bankers who steal from people. <laughs> <laughs> because those bankers are the ones who manipulated the money and took our houses. Put some lights on them. Uh, they're the ones who got bailed out uh, and got long-term low interest loans, and the people could not. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm very concerned that we're not overreact to the police in the sense that they are the gatekeepers. I agree. And what, what, what do they keep behind the gate? If, if you spend all the energy on the police, you miss now, no time left to deal with Microsoft and Google and eBay uh, and what's behind the valley. Because the, the, the security we seek, the growth we seek, the opportunity we seek is beyond the, the, the gate. And so I think, I think you're right to, to fight that fight. But uh, while we're going to solve this in, in Ferguson, but will we come out of it with a plan for reconstruction? Because some of the money that was spent to make police more accountable should be spent on jobs and skilled trade training. I wish you'd had X number of police with cameras on their back, X number of kids in STEM research, and X number of children with a job. To me, that would be a more balanced approach. So we're going to take a question from this side of the room. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, my name is Deba White, and I'm deaf. Um, I lost my hearing when I was three, so I learned to talk. My parents put me on oral scrolls, so that's I how I can I can't hear you talk. good, dear. I can't hear you good. I can't oh, you hear, can't hear me well? Come on down, please. I can't hear you good. I'm from the older, illest generation. I have to hear. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. My name is Deborah White, and I am deaf. I became deaf when I was three years old. My parents put me on oral school, and that's how I learned to talk. And I also know some sign language. I am so grateful to be here tonight. And I wanted to bring my son, but because I'm thinking about running for president, I don't want anybody to make fun of his outfit. He's 16. <laughs> um, um, the reason why I'm here tonight is because I've seen, um, let's say, 
we don't have enough support in the deaf community. We need a lot more minorities to learn sign language, which is really important because there are so many bright, bright students and adults out there that are looking for work and they could really use your support if there's a lot of classes out there. There's a lot of American Sign Language classes and we really encourage you to try to sign up and you know, to, be, to participate in their lives. Um, there's so many out there There could be good doctors and there's so many out there that can be a good policeman, lawyers. Well, I am in the process of trying to be a lawyer, but there's, 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 there's so many out there. And we really appreciate it if you could try to get involved in the community, make them feel like they're home and loved. And we, we really could use your support and I really appreciate that. Well, I, I have a sister who is deaf, so I understand. But how did you learn to talk so well? My parents put me in an oral school when I was three. Um, I think I was about five or so. And um, we went to a school in Rockville, Maryland. And that's how I speak so well. I, I lost a lot of my hearing in my left ear, but I have like a little bit in my right ear, but I still have to wear my hearing like four times to be able to hear sounds. But I basically depends on lip reading or rely on the interpreter. And these two ladies are wonderful tonight. They really are. <laughs> well, uh, I hope that you will continue your, your education, but I want you, you will not be the first deaf president. <laughs> <We've> had... <laughs> well, that's gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, I hope you win, you won't be the first one though. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for one last question um, from this side of the room, and I'm sorry for those of you who have lined up, but we um, we do have to get Reverend Jackson to Kwanzaa after this. Bipolar, um, MC, and a political organizer. First, I want to say solidarity with Turtle Island and the indigenous people of this land who was stolen by the U.S. government. And let's not forget that the fact that off our backs as black people, this nation was built. And I hear a lot of talk about America and Barack Obama. But let's not forget Barack Obama is dropping bombs on children that look just like us. And the situation that we talk about trusting Jesse Jackson, trusting these people who sit there as gay holders, but the whole thing is they sit there holding the gate. And the situation is we don't have access, because I hear a lot of talk about the STEM situation, but the STEM situation reminds me a lot about Booker T. Washington and talking about let's sell some peanuts, okay? So the real situation of it is why were you booed off of, off of, out of Ferguson and you use that as like that something of having some ground while at the same time our children are sitting here dying and you're advocating that we stay peaceful and calm while we're getting gunned down in the streets. This is not something that shows that you have solidarity with us as black people, at least the poor people that don't make it to college and don't get avoided by the police because you might sue. Man, what are you doing to show solidarity with the people who are being killed and so in solidarity with Ferguson, which you asked them for money after going there and speaking on the death of a child how is this, how are we looking to these people? How are we looking to Jesse Jackson? And how is he even standing up for us? He's not. He's sitting there looking at his own interest. And that's why he speaks about America over and over again, about like it stood up for us at all. When it, from the beginning, it's been about putting us in bondage. Because slavery never ended. 13th Amendment, it's called prison. And we're sitting here dying day after day. And we're sitting here with a president that is supposedly black, but he's dropping bombs on black children. Come on, man. So thank you for your question. Well, I think, it, I think his concern is real, and, and his pain is real. First of all, uh, I went to five continents marching against the Iraq war, uh, which I thought was wrong when it happened. Uh, I went to jail to fight to free Mandela. I also went to jail to free me. And, and so I think that this struggle is not a new struggle. It has continuity, uh, and I would hope even when brothers go off like this because of their pain, embrace their pain uh, and embrace them. Do not let him get away. Love him until he feels better about himself. Uh, I might add that uh, I have a new identity, uh, at Rev J. Jackson. That's my Twitter <laughs> number. 
How many, how many of y'all on Twitter? Uh-huh, at Rev and Facebook, like me, Reverend Jesse L. Jackson, Sr., and uh, Instagram coming soon. <laughs>